Hello. Can you hear me? Cool. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Welcome to Vibe Osmosis. Thank you. Thank you. I love your. Uh, <laughs> I love how you look right now. It's a uh, Halloween spooky. I'm actually about to go to a um, like a costume party house show. Oh, cool, cool. That's awesome, dude. Um, uh, so happy Friday the 13th. Yes, indeed. <laughs> a magical day. Um, so um, I've been listening to your music quite a bit. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, what you do. Cool. Uh, I'm Phoenix Alexander, 29 years old. I make music, I make visual art. Uh, I own an indie record label, and uh, it's kind of like turned into like a multimedia company. And yeah. that's pretty much, uh, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> um, all right, so like what inspired the name Soul Psych? Um, so great question. I am fucking terrible at coming up with names for anything and everything. Like when I name a song, I just name it after like some random lyrics in the song. Like I can't name things. Well, that's um, pretty good. I mean, at least you can identify what lyrics in the song, you know, makes the song. True that, true that. Yeah. And maybe it's easier to identify what a uh, song it is by the song title. I don't know. But right. um, yeah, so like when I thought of Soul Psych, I just went with it. Cause like, I'm, I, I knew I couldn't come up with anything even close to being as good. I think that it's a cool name. I like like the alliteration and it just happened to me one day. Like I remember exactly where I was and everything. I was driving this, uh, I used to work at a waffle shop. I was a manager and uh, I was driving like the company Prius car and I was just like, oh, cool. And I just like had that idea. So I just always went with it. I'm a, I'm a Yaris driver myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right on. Yeah. It, yeah. It keeps the, uh, uh, I don't know, it keeps the uh, mileage all right as far as like how much gas you're putting in. But I, I really want to get the hybrids right now. It's just the burning thing. Um, how do you feel about the whole switch up from electric or from gas to electric cars now? Um, I think that, uh, <laughs> Man, that that's that's quite the question. Um, you know, I guess like my only reservation with like Teslas, for example, is that those batteries cost like fifteen grand to replace. Yeah, and it's just like the batteries, like the whole like underside of the car, like that's kind of nutty. Um, yeah. I think that we could definitely run. I think that we're far enough with technology where we could run cars a lot better. It's just that um, gas and oil companies would miss out on like you know, trillions of dollars or whatever. So I think that that's probably why we don't have efficient cars and why even with electric cars, there's gonna be setbacks, but you know, that's like a whole can of worms. <laughs> if you were rich enough, would you buy one of these flying cars that are gonna come out in the future, whatever they say? Yeah, I guess um, if, I, if I was rich, I would do my best to still drive shitty cars and act like I'm poor, um, but that's yeah. just me. Yeah, yeah, like that's what I would want, but um, like I, you, I, I don't know because I'm not in that place, you know. Like if I had a bunch of money, maybe I wouldn't do that at all. Maybe I would buy a bunch of fancy cars and stuff. I don't know. Uh, I've never been a car person, so like, like I'm just like really bad with cars. Uh, I don't. Like, I, can't, I can't even tell you. Like I, I, I know what car that I have only because I had to Google it last night. That's like the only reason I know. My car, like I'm, my license currently just got suspended because I'm that bad with cars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, understood. Um, I'm about to say, I'm like that might speak for itself on this one. <laughs> they, other, I feel like other people that know me is like it's on brand. Like the guy is bad. Um, like my dad gave me um a Mercedes, the the baby car, and like I'm the baby of the family, and I and I crash it so soon. And like, I, even to this day, I'm like, if only I, you know, didn't drive the Mercedes that one day, I would have one and it would be driving so fine and far. And now I'm stuck with my shitty Yaris and I'm just like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like, this is karma. But my, you know, in my point of view now, I'm like, yeah, it would take me a long time to work enough money to buy a Mercedes to just give it to my son. So that's just the generation that we're living in. Um, <laughs> first world problems, I'm telling you. Indeed, yes. Um, so, have you always lived out in um, Oregon? Are you Oregon now, or are you Portland? I live in Portland. I've lived here for seven years. Um, before that, I was raised in Salt Lake City, Utah. 
and I lived there for 21. So that's been my whole life, just those two cities. Um, what do you think about the switch up from Salt Lake to Portland? I've been to both. Um, Salt Lake is a weird place and it's changed so much since I've lived there. So yeah. like my, my take on it, I don't think is accurate anymore. I just think that it's changed so much. So like, I, I can like, I can conceptualize Salt Lake as what it used to be, you know? Um, it's hard for me to have any real idea of what it is now just because I hear so much feedback from friends back home that it has changed so much. Right. So, um, but at the time, Salt Lake was uh, still uh, like the Californians and Seattle people and tech people. They hadn't really moved there yet. So it was like a totally different place. And I don't know, it's like, like as far as music went, it was brutal, dude. Like, there, like there's like <laughs> two venues and they're owned by like the same guy. Like two venues that like local bands can play and they're owned by like the same guy. And, um, you know, it's just, you come to Portland and there's like bars all over the place. Salt Lake, ha I don't know if they still do, pardon me, but um, when I was growing up there, the alcohol laws were insane. Huh. Like, uh, getting into Uh-huh. Yes, it yeah. is. Yes. Yeah. 0.3% cap on alcohol is what it used to be. It changed 0.5, but then they lowered the DUI from 0.8 to 0.5. So it's wow. actually easier to get a DUI now, from what I understand. And um, they used to like pull people taking a cab home and breathalyze the passenger and give them a DUI. It's like, what? You know, like, oh, uh, yeah, no, so, uh, yeah, being associated. So bars being able to like have bands play live there, it's just not really like, it's not the same thing as you come to Portland and like instantly we were like the house band for um, this like tavern in town. And so we had like a guaranteed like once a month gig there and then yeah. we would find another gig and that's kind of what got us started. Um, and that was with a band called The Wild War. Uh, I, I used to be in that band. Like that's why I moved to Portland was that I was just in this band. I didn't even know where Oregon was on a map. Like, it was pretty sad. <laughs> like, I had, yeah, no idea where I, was, I had no idea where I was moving. I was just so, like, open-minded, and I hated Salt Lake at the time. So, like, I came here, and every city has its problems. Every city's got 50% bad, 50% good, and it's just, what do you want to focus on? And the focus changes over time, you know, because we're, we're human, and there's a big duality to our nature. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm just trying to... The, there's a lot of things about Portland that I really, really like, such as home recording studios are like everywhere. Professional studios, there was a, a, like twice as many when I first moved here as now, a lot of them are closed. Um, engineers that have worked on like really great albums, um, albums that I like grew up with and listened to and respected. And um, there was like this dude named Mike Thrasher who unfortunately passed, or wait, yeah, Mike Thrasher. Um, he passed away like a few years ago, but he was the dude, like he was the dude that was responsible for all like those 90 bands coming to Portland um, in the during the 90s. And without him, like the network for music wouldn't be the same. So uh, he did like a lot for this place and I never got to meet the guy, but you know, it's just like going from one place that had none of that <laughs> to a place that had like tons of that is awesome. True. Um... I've, I've done like a little bit of traveling like in the van and stuff like my friends and um, I don't know, later on eventually moved out to Seattle and like before COVID, I was like first off just like, yeah, like this, this, uh, this city kind of has like a lot to offer as far as like every single night you're getting um, acts and it's like a filled bill until the bar is closed and then it, you know it kind of changed after COVID but to kind of see that yeah. first off I was like wow you can spend literally 10 bucks here and hang out all night if you're drinking at the bar and stuff and like you're getting to see all these bands that some of them you know you, you might have seen on Spotify and you're like wow I can't believe like I've actually heard of them and they're just here playing right now and um, that was one of those things because I'm from Ohio originally and like the scene out here it's like if a bigger band comes it's like almost everybody you know either knows about it or it's like oh that band's playing i'm totally not going to that show because i know the people going there and like you just don't get that experience whenever you go to a city where it's like it's totally free to be yourself and experience the music too yeah yeah uh, um, so 
I was kind of wondering, like, is that a little bit what it, it, it like gave you that experience with like making your own stuff, like to uh, do? Because um, you have like a lot of a variety of sounds and uh, throughout <laughs> your record. Um, so, like, is that kind of like some of the influence behind that, or, or how did that kind of come to be for you? Yeah, um, sometimes I make music, like, especially during COVID, I was trying to make music that was so different from what I was experiencing, because for me, music is very much an escape. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes my, like, what I'm experiencing um, correlates to what sounds I'm making, yes. And then other times, no, and it's kind of hard for me to, like, look back and reflect on which ones are which, you know? Like, um, I would say that... Uh, yeah, like being able to be myself more openly probably relaxed me a bit. But also, like when I lived in Salt Lake, it kind of gave, like, I don't want to say like gave me an edge, but something along those lines, you know? Um, like, I kind of like being a, a, a bit rebellious against what's going on. And so, but you know, like letting go of that, moving to Portland was definitely interesting and probably influenced my songwriting to some degree during a period but it's kind of hard for me to think back on uh, to be honest well the look back on the 2020 record that you show um uh, if i'm getting this one right it's uh, the earth one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. that one i listened to uh, quite a few times it's the first thing that i've heard of yours um, was that like, I, I seen it was in July 2020, so it was kind of in the midst of like, what is happening in general? Do you think like that kind of also influenced like the sound? Because further on, you, I feel like you really took the dive in making more um, music, but like, well, also you started recording with other artists, and how did that kind of come to be? Yeah, so, um... Sorry, there's two questions there. Which one do you want me to ask first? Sure, yeah, you just go for it. Like, uh, you, okay. you, started, you started working with artists, and then it kind of came to July 2020. Okay, so, yeah, you know, um, Earth, I, let's see, I, oh, man, I'm trying to, like, remember, like, Earth took about, like, a year to make. Like, we were going to the studio, like, once a week, every week, for just, like, a couple hours, and just kind of chipping away at it. Okay. And, um, so yeah, it probably took less than a year to make actually. And we actually made two albums during that period. Right. My al my solo album called Solo, um, that it, that was actually made alongside Earth. Gotcha. And okay, here, here okay, I, now I have the good answer for you. So, <laughs> uh, when I moved here, we were playing a lot with the Wild Boar. We were playing out live a lot. And then when we got Soul Psych together, we were doing that. And then um, at some point I just kind of, felt like I had totally overplayed the city with like just in general uh, and this was before COVID this was like a year before COVID and I just thought you know what I just want to go in the studio and just make some albums for a bit and uh, that's just what I want to do like um my inspirations were like the gorillas like when the gorillas started like the uh the first gorillas album is one of like my fondest memories of like getting that cd and listening to it and I think that that probably has a lot to do with why we sound very different throughout even our albums there's a lot of different sounds because that album was like that and uh that album just like affected me so much and i just wanted to kind of do something along the lines of that a bit more and then i also watched like the primal scream documentary and um like uh for uh scream adelica and i it just made me rethink how to make albums um because i had only made like a few at, the, at that point and so i just really kind of wanted to like switch gears and what i felt required what was required of me to do that was to stop playing live for just a temporary you know a year or two um i just wanted to go in the studio and just kind of hibernate in the studio more or less and then COVID happened yeah and so like that was that was mostly well i mean COVID like wasn't a good thing at all but i i mean like the situation was kind of good for me because um I didn't invest into a tour that was going to get canceled, rebooked, canceled again, you know, and then everyone's like, oh my gosh, like, which sucked. And I'm sure like my heart goes out to anyone that lost a lot of money financially. But, um, you know, like for me, like it was like, OK, well, I don't have to change my operations at all. Like I'm already hibernating in the studio. Like I can still do that 
during this. So that, um, I, like for me, like the timing just worked out. I don't, you know, like uh, I had no control of it. And so now we're actually getting like a live band uh, together and it'll probably be a few months till like we're playing uh, around like the Pacific Northwest and then I'd like to go down to California. And I just want to learn from our mistakes in the past. So the second part of your question was, um, uh, well, oh, sorry, let me say one more thing about the first part is Earth. I wanted to add more like Mellotrons. I want to add like 12 string guitars. I want to add like a drum machine. Like none of that really was in like our first album. And so it was like super different. And I wanted just like a variety of songs. And I don't know, it's just like an inspiring period of time for me. So the second part of your question was like, how do I go about um, finding collaborators? And it's always just been yeah. natural. Uh, the internet is um, probably mostly to, to, to thank for that. Um, I go, I try and go to a lot of shows when I can, and that's a really great way to meet people. Um, we started doing our magazine. That's been like <laughs> the best way to meet people um, for me. And, you know, it's just kind of always like, I've always had it. So Brian Jones and Massacre were like, a huge influence on me starting Soul Psych the way that I did in that it was going to mostly or I, I was going to be like the consistent member with other people on like different albums and okay. pretty much we've done that um uh and it's just always telling people what my mindset is what my plan is then they know what to expect and I've just had a lot of people say yes thankfully and like you know um there's there's been like 20 plus people that worked on this project and they've all done an amazing job in their own way and they added their own flavor and their own character and um one of like our best one of my favorite collaborators that we've had is uh dustin divevig he does a project called brass clouds but he used to be in a band called federale which would tour with brian jones and massacre and um so like uh he's he's just like been like one of my favorite collaborators because our drummer who's like listening to our tracks and like learning them he's like man who did the drums on this song this song and this song i'm wondering the same if they were all colin <laughs> i mean sorry colin sorry colin's also in federal that's why i got them mixed up uh, it was all <laughs> dustin it was all dustin and uh -huh. i was like oh yeah like that's how good of a drummer that he is is that you can like be like man i really really like the drums in these three songs are all by the same dude so like uh dustin is like you know a thousand percent in my mind one of like the best mu musicians that we've had but they've all been awesome in their own way and it doesn't it, being a good musician isn't a requirement for collabing with us necessarily it's um you know like i love the ramones and like they they never like really got that good at their instruments and it's kind of about the soul it took, it took a long time <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah what one of my questions it's, it's a really good thing that you mentioned about the drumming situation, but um, one of the songs I really liked that I highlighted, um, Razor Blades for Breakfast. Oh, okay. Oh, you listen to Uranus. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's not on Spotify yet. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> so, oh, oh, would you like to know, like, what that song's about? Yeah, and, like, and, and basically, did you do it, like, track by track, or did you do some of it, like, live and then record it? Like, how did you go about, like, trying to do that sound and that, like, texture and that vibe? Cool, cool. Um, it was recorded onto a Tascam. Um, the Uranus sessions were mostly two sessions back to back. And I, it was very lo-fi sound. And uh, I actually produced all of it and did all the instruments myself, just song by song. So like none of those songs existed before that session. So I really just needed, like I hadn't, I felt bad because I was so focused on other things I hadn't been writing. So I was like, you know, I just want to just want to record some songs. And it just was like a really good like stream of consciousness recording session. So I was just making up everything as I went with those two uh, sessions. And that's most of Uranus. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it's recording on a tape with all the instruments. Uh, the, the, what, it, what it means is uh, I use, so I was raised uh, with like a holistic like mindset and diet from like from my, my father. And then I got, which translated to me getting a job at Whole Foods in Salt Lake, in Salt Lake City, like downtown Salt Lake, where there are like the, the more like rich, like close to being yuppies. Uh, at least at the time, I, again, I don't know what it's like now. And um, so you'd have all these like weird people coming through, like 
with all these like weird diet things, you know, and I was a vegan for four years. So like I was one of those people too. And I was at the salad bar, uh, just like refilling it for like my, my coworker. And uh, it was pretty slow. And there's this one dude at the salad bar. He's like, hey man, can you get me some raw chicken? And I thought he was joking. I was like, oh, that's hilarious. Like, can, you, can you give me some raw chicken for my salad? I was like, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> like, uh, even if I wanted to, that's like against the rules. Like I would get fired if someone found out. And he's like, yeah, man, like I eat raw chicken, like right before I eat these, uh, run these marathons. Um, I eat like a bunch of raw chicken and it just gives me like the energy I need. So that's like what the chorus is, is like, gives me the energy I need. And, um, so then, you know, obviously, uh, so that's like the second verse is about like the raw chicken, if I'm not mistaken. The first verse is about razor blades, which is just kind of like a spoof of that or satire of that, where it's like, yeah, you shouldn't be doing this, but you don't care. Like you, all of your education and your culture has told you not to do this. And like hundreds of years of evolution have told you not to do this and you don't care. So like you're you're gonna do it whatever and um so what's the what's the difference between eating the bowl or razor blades for breakfast you know <laughs> for uh, me i mean it's a satirical extreme like uh a comparison but one yeah. that i think is 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 somewhat uh you know logical um it really it really uh i guess that's the tone for the rest of the record too so um, yeah Mm -hmm. what, like whenever you're doing these songs are you starting with something do you write stuff or like it, does the inspiration of, or like the correlation behind it come, like, come later or is it all like happening like just conjuring up and feeding it you know mm -hmm. each album is pretty different to yeah, be but honest but so you, said that you did it in like one whole session or two back to back different sessions so it's just like in that recording time where you just kind of like this is my idea for this one or were you kind of like building the song up and then that's like how you found it um nowadays i start a lot with the drums okay. and, and then i and then bass and then i kind of worry about the other stuff so it's kind of just like building a song from scratch starting with building a foundation first and I don't even know what's going on top sometimes. <laughs> there's been in, there's been albums where the approach is the opposite. Um, right. But one nice thing about that is that um, like I record to a click now and so everything can get really locked in. And, and in fact, I think most of our albums are recorded to a click except for uh, Neptune and Saturn are not. And well, actually, and, and then I one other one. I can never do a click. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Oh, and, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't blame you. Um, the, the trick is for me to to just do the click with the drums, and then and then the drums are my click from then on. Because I but I don't need something that's like totally perfectly in time. Um, I like mistakes in music. I like music that is genuine and isn't perfect and isn't like a corporate product for like the most basic level of satisfaction, you know, and like, I don't know, I just like music that's more genuine. So to me, that's how I can do that. If you want a different sound, then that might not be the route for you, you know, and a lot of it is like what you're saying, like, you know, want knowing like what kind of sound that you want, you kind of have to strategize according to that, you know, um, like, I'm not a sports guy at all. Like, I'm, I'm less of a sports guy than a car guy, which is like, like I say, like to the to the floor, like bottom. Um, however, I'm starting to see a lot more aspects between sports and music just being relevant. And I almost think of it as like, I'm kind of like, the, and for that session, I was kind of like the coach and all of the players, you know? And it's like, <laughs> you, you start with the coach talking to the players and then, and then the players go out and enact what was pre-established, you know? Um, like, and, and you don't see the first part, you know? That's, that's kind of like the pre-production, I suppose. And then that's the production. And like, I don't know, for some reason, like I kind of see it like that now, um, way more than before. And just knowing what you're doing before you go in there and having to ch change course and everything, like it, it allows me to be able to produce a song in like, you know, 40 minutes or something. Cause Razor Blades for Breakfast probably took like under an hour to fully produce that song, I think, and record it and, Every, you know, like, and then I, I didn't go into that session with any of those songs really um, uh, pre-written or anything. I just, Tabula Rasa. Um, we've written some of our best material like that, but then I've had sessions where I just get everything like perfect and like everything's written out before. So, I mean, 
You know, it just, it just depends on what I want to accomplish or what I'm working with or whatever. Uranus was just kind of a, a, a mistake like a mistake as far as like kids you know like like you're a mistake but you're still like an awesome kid and all that you know that's like how i feel about uranus like i, I think i wrote on the band camp like i'm calling it uranus because i pulled it out of my ass or something like that um because it, it, it was something that just kind of happened oh very sweet um the one that i mean i seen that you even did a single for dissatisfaction Yes, that, that was actually recorded in a very similar way, but at a at, at, at a studio studio, um, yeah. not like not like my home studio. That one, we went into the studio. I, had, I only had two hours booked, and uh, I was with uh, I was at La Bija Factory of Sound Recording, which is a studio in Portland that I've made lots of albums at, and other bands have. And Andrew is the main engineer, and he's been a huge part of Soul Psych. Um, we went in this session with zero ideas, and we were like, well, what should we do? I was like, well, I'll let you play that synth and I'll play some drums. So then we just got like, boom, ba, boom, ba, and then Andrew did like that cool um, synth part. And yeah. then uh, I was reading Faust at the time, so I just scratched down some lyrics. I, you know, I don't give a fuck, I don't believe in luck, uh, where do I sign and all that, because that's that's what Faust is, is it's a magician yeah. selling himself to, selling his soul to the devil. And um, I viewed it uh, in that moment I started to make these connections between what musicians oftentimes do with record labels where you sell everything away you get none of your publishing you get none of your copyright and you don't even like you get in advance but it's more of a loan and you're just paying that back and anytime they buy you a hotel room that's adding on to your debt and it's just kind of like a big trick because just like in Faust he's like promising all these things and then they don't happen you know that's kind of like similar so I just kind of made all those connections in the moment while Andrew was mixing what we had. And I was like, hey, can I do some vocals? But yeah, by the end of that session, um, we had the song done. Like it was, it just needed to be mastered. And uh, so that was, but we, we can't bank on that. You know, sometimes when you go into a session with zero ideas, that doesn't happen at all. Um, so we were, we're very fortunate that that happened and I'm very thankful. And I pro I definitely couldn't have done it without Andrew. Um, cause that is one of my favorite soul psych songs and very neat. Um, yeah. It was just cool. Um, and, and I guess, yeah, I mean, you should be proud of that one, I guess. Uh, I, I, one, one of the ones too was, uh, products of dub, you know, cool. that one, yeah, that one's <laughs> one where you're like, how, like, well, how did that come to be? Because you get so much different influences in this, as you're already getting like the full dose of like the psychedelic experience. Um, so kind of like how, how did that one happen for you cool um so the the first gorillas album like i had met, uh brought up before that actually probably has something to do with that because there's some dub influence on that Definitely. and i like how i like what they did with that dub influence and i like that they kind of did something of their own with it a little bit and then there's a remix album called the gorillas versus the space monkeys and uh that's even more dub influence so I was like, I, I was riding the bus back and forth from work and Andrew, my bandmate, had sent me um, some dub albums to check out. And yeah. uh, so that was a big influence on that. And then, yeah, like the guitar solo, like I'm trying to think like, you know, I, it doesn't really sound like Funkadelic, but I was listening to a lot of Funkadelic at the time. But I wanted, uh, I wanted the guitar solo to just really like lay in there like like just really like soft and gentle and like free flowing and relaxing and i don't know somehow we pulled that off like that 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 song i made as a demo first on on uh i think like my phone like the garage band app on my phone or maybe it was my laptop and i just like looped a drum and then came up with like the the bass line and the guitar parts and then um the lyrics i was writing the lyrics and i was like man am i really gonna kill with these <laughs> <laughs> but then I just like couldn't think of any other direction that I really wanted to go and like so I grew up Mormon you might find that interesting um, and I find religion very fascinating you know I think that like anything there's good and there's bad and um, I'm sorry to what extent to what extent uh, to, to what extent what was I Mormon yeah to what extent did you yeah did you like did you believe it? Did you have experiences? Like, you know what I mean? Or was it out of circumstance? Um, definitely circumstance. I never formed a belief for it. 
ever. Yeah. And uh, I, by eight years old, was like, I'm not going every week. Um, and then by the time I was like 10 or 11, I wasn't going at all. And it just went from like going like once every other week to like not at all, just a gradual thing. And uh, it was possible for me to do that because of my my household situation is that um, my mom's side of the family is, is mostly Mormon. And my mom passed away when I was like seven, yeah, seven years old and about to turn eight. And so um, I, I hadn't formed a belief till then. I don't think anyone can at that age form a real belief on anything. I think that you're just going with the flow of life uh, at yeah. such an extremely young age. And, but I never bought into it. I never believed it. I never, you know, that's just like, that was me. But like a lot of my family still are Mormon and I don't, I'm not trying to diss anyone's beliefs, like whatever, you want to believe that, cool. And uh, I used to not be like that, by the way. I was pretty staunch uh, the other way for a while. Right. And now I'm trying to get back in the middle, you know, trying to be respectful and everything. So, um, but I never believed it. And then when I lost, when my mom passed away, uh, my brother was still living with me, but then he shortly got married. And so he was also very Mormon. Uh, my dad was not Mormon. And so that was like my saving grace. That was like how I could, because uh, now now my mom and my brother are all of a sudden gone. And then there's my dad who's like, yeah, I mean, like he, he would drive around. I would drive around with him um, and he would just talk to me, you know, and like he would just like share his thoughts. And I, and I would do the same and like, um, he, sometimes he would just say things like what didn't make sense to him about this and that and this and that and sometimes religion would come up and it just made a lot of sense what he was saying you know so like I, that was kind of like I, I kind of went more with that but then I I have very different beliefs than what my dad had my dad was very much like I don't know the answer and that's that's mostly how I am but um you know I think that there's truth in most religions I think there's like even just like a shred of truth and everything like I think that there probably is something beyond our understanding of what's happening. And I don't think we'll ever understand. And I think that we have a desire to understand and people and organizations will manipulate you because of that. Cults, right. religions, they, they have done that throughout time. I think that even political parties uh, do do essentially that as well. Uh, not not all political parties, but throughout history, um, you know, uh, some really dark periods of time. I'm sure you know which ones I'm referring to. Oh, operated very much as religion and um and 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 going for that so you know nowadays i just kind of throw up my hands and say i don't know the answers yeah i'm kind of on the same same thing it's like even out of my own experiences i can't necessarily rule anything out yet um this one goes into one of my favorite vibe osmosis questions because um i think it would be interesting um, if you're stranded on an island and you could only bring one thing with you, what would you bring? Only one thing? Probably, oh, pro probably a guitar. A guitar. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably, because then I probably can still friend. sing and play guitar. <laughs> you know. Um, my, my acoustic guitar, I've had it my whole life. Like, there are pictures of me as a baby going up to it like, oh, whoa, you know? Um, so like, it's like my, it's like my best friend, you know? So, um... Uh, that that's probably what I would what I would bring. Um, and also to uh, how you have these albums under the uh, under planets names. Is that mm -hmm. kind of something that happened like on purpose? Did you kind of go out of way to um, you know seek out an album about like the different planets, or like what kind of inspired that for you? Yeah, it was definitely something that was uh, that we were planning on doing. Uh, I don't really know why exactly at this point. I think I've forgotten. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, like, well, you got uh, a lot more to go through. <laughs> yeah, we have to, we have two more planets, and and we're we're so over naming them after planets. To be honest, like, we just want to name them something creative and something unique and and whatnot. But it's also really cool. I think like I, I no regrets, no regrets. 
Um, but yeah, like each album when we're making it, I, I try and set some time aside and study the albums a bit. I mean, sorry, the planets a bit and study some information about them and, and the corresponding gods and, and, and cultural perceptions and, uh, about those planets and those gods. So that was um, the mentality was that he, I, I guess he, here's like where it came from is that each album was supposed to have like a different vibe, which we've pretty much done. And um, so that's kind of why I named him after planet slash gods is that all those planets are so different in size, shape, color, position. Yeah. And um, and I try like uh, Mercury, I tried to make a pretty barren sounding album, pretty stripped down and kind of desolate feeling. For a lot of those songs because of of how that just the vibe that that planet gives me when i look at it i just think i wouldn't want to be stranded there for any length of time you know it just it just looks so desolate and, and creepy compared to all the other ones in my opinion they say that the uh, moons take a while for it to go across to so even, understood yeah even the moons would have a <laughs> <laughs> um, so this gets me into uh, the next thing about virtual world. Okay. So, yeah, the music, and, and also you do your own artwork for a lot of these. I see. Yes. So, yes. So like, it kind of inspired you to you know get into the artwork aspect, and also like what you know inspired like the artwork itself. Okay. Um. Sorry. Let me just say really quick. It says I only have three and a half more minutes of remaining meeting time. Is that because I don't have like a subscription to Zoom or something? Yeah, but but to say I just will re-tap up the meeting and then it re-records. Cool, re cool. Okay, sorry, I just want to give you a heads up. So if I disappear, it's not, <laughs> it's not me doing it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the art, so the, the concept for virtual world as a whole and it correlates with the artwork is um, that we've, we've gone through, we're, we're into a new phase of humanity. Um, we're in a new phase of our species. This is all brand new historically. Historically, World War II is, is brand new, you know? Um, so technology and iPhones and smartphones, and this is all right here. Like we're like the first generations with it. And uh, it's really kind of, it has a lot of positive and negative aspects and some really dark aspects to it. And so virtual world, the whole idea is, I'm here, this is who I wanna be, this is what I am but it's not really me you know it's kind of like what the lyrics were those lyrics actually um we we just did like a test vocal with like the weird sound effect for fun and i he was andrew was like just make some stuff up so i just made up all those lyrics but um like they do mean something to me looking back and that was like what i had going on like in my thoughts while i was making it but um yeah like it uh that's just kind of i i just have a lot of feelings about technology both good and bad um, Internet is also another song where it's very much like the same themes. And so the album cover uh, I made in, in uh, 3D uh, Blender just because I think that's also a another step in, in artistic evolution. Um, and I'm no master at 3D art, but it is um, something that you're going to see more and more, especially with music as time goes on and I as the technology gets better and as computers get better because computers are evolving at such an alarming rate you know technology as a whole but computers are if you look at how they were 10 years ago versus now i mean how long does it take for an organic species to evolve like millions of years you know hundreds of years to evolve in slight small ways and yet computers are doing it in you know it seems like every year they're getting that much better or the potential to get better is and that's even just in the the public sector and the private sector I can't even imagine, my friend. Yeah, that's a, that's definitely a good point, uh, especially for what the government hides from us. Well, on this note, we'll get back to it. I'm gonna pause this. Hold on. Okay. Cool. Well, how you doing, dude? I'm doing well. Okay, so um, yeah, favorite instrument. What's my favorite instrument? Um, I mean, probably. Probably singing, if that's an instrument. I'd probably say singing. Uh, if you, not singing, like if we're not counting that, probably guitar. <laughs> yes. Uh, how long have you been playing guitar? Uh, 
I started to take it seriously when I was like 16. Uh, 16, 17 is when I started like, yeah, yeah, 16. I started to take it seriously. Um, I had always wanted to play it. Like I saw School Rock when I was like eight years old and I was like, oh my God, I want to play guitar. And um, so like, you know, I've learned like some stuff. My dad was a musician. Uh, my dad was a banjo player. Uh, he was considered like the best banjo player in Utah for like years. And like, I, I genuinely believe that that's true. Um, so he would like, you know, notate me uh, surf rock songs like Pipeline and Hawaii Five-O or whatever. Uh, I, I remember there's like one, I can't remember the band's name, there's one like surf band, I would like learn a bunch of their songs. And uh, then I started getting, getting into uh, like heavier music and then I wanted to do that. And like, we would just do like palm muted drop D. Like we didn't know how to play really. And we didn't really know how to, but like, so I've, I've been like messing around with it since I was like eight years old. But um, 16 is when I was like, you know what? I want to learn. I want to learn this, and I want to spend like hours every day, like trying to understand this thing. Um, so, did you ever get lessons, or did you kind of always just self-taught? So, uh, so uh, my dad was considered like the best banjo player for years and years and years. And then there was this child prodigy, just came along. 15 years old was better than my dad at banjo. Like, wow. truly, like, yeah, like freak of nature but in a good way right <laughs> um and his name is jake workman well instead of being like really jealous my dad in instead of my dad being like really jealous and being like oh my gosh my my days are over and my title's over and all this he was like stoked like he was so like stoked that someone else wanted to even anytime that someone wanted to learn how to play the banjo he'd be like so stoked and he inspired people to want to learn to play the banjo and he was always like thrilled about that um and so uh when he saw jake at 15 he he was like you know he was like i'll drop anything and help you in any way that i can <laughs> and so and that's how everyone was towards jake because he was an amazing amazing banjo player and uh then he started playing guitar mastered guitar in no time like by 17 years old was like better than jimmy page i mean it's just like insane you know um and then uh so my dad eventually like I told him hey I want to take guitar seriously you know I want to learn it like but I want to really learn it this time and um and he was like well you know like Jake Workman could be someone that you could learn from and I was so intimidated that I put off learning lessons for like I don't know a year pardon me no I, maybe a few months I, it's hard to think back but yeah like a, a few months I was kind of intimidated and then I just was like you know what whatever I want it like <laughs> I want to just get started on this. I, 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 I was like practicing myself. I was like trying to teach myself and I was like hitting all these brick walls. It's like, you know what? I'm going to give Jake a call. And uh, man, it's it's like you're in the room with like this child prodigy who was at that time like 25. And it's like it's like soul crushing to sit there. And he's like, OK, well, play play me like what you you know, be like, how long have you been playing guitar all this? And I tell him, oh, what kind of bands are you like? OK, like. He's not really into those bands, but whatever, you know, like 60s rock and roll bands. He was like, yeah, you know, it's tolerable and uh, for him. And uh, so he'd be like, okay, now play this. And it was just like soul crushing, just like, you, 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 like you're playing in front of a god, you know? And like every lesson was just like equally parts discouraging and inspiring for me. Um, like it was, he was just like the biggest motivator in my life for years. And I, I studied under him for at least two years. Um, and shame on me for ever stopping. But also, I just felt like uh, it was time for me to, to start doing something different, which I started recording music um, a lot more. And the, the best thing that Jake ever taught me was he said, look, man, not everyone's trying to be the world's greatest guitar player. He said, some people are just trying to make really great music. And that, like, just light went off. You know, I, I had a purpose, finally, you know? And ever since then, I've just strived for that. That is really interesting. I feel like whenever I took uh, guitar lessons, my guitar teacher was just like, Jimi Hendrix, play that one. Um, let me teach you another cover song. Let me teach you the strokes. 
And then I was like, okay, at that point I was like, I don't think I need to go to your class anymore once you taught me like three rap songs, you know? <clears throat> I was just like, oh, you taught me how to do like Rotelia when I was young, and I was like, oh, man, I should probably apply this and make some other weird guitar stuff. But then, I at the same time, did you ever go through like a period where you just like quit playing music in general? Um, once that spark was lit, I played and played and played and overplayed and was super yeah. stressed out while I was playing. And eventually I got tendonitis. Oh. And um, so I actually had to put down the guitar for like, I mean, I still would record guitar because I mean, once you practice as much as I had, it's like I can still pick it up and play. But like my arm was like killing me. I was getting like shoulder spasms like I, I just never adopted a good a good posture and I never learned how to relieve myself of stress. I you know I, I was go 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 for years. And nowadays like I you know like I have an Xbox and I'll like force myself like to sit down and take my mind off things with just an escape, you know. And um I just didn't I never was like that before. So like it ended up kind of being a bad thing that I was like so like I have an obsessive personality for hot, like activities or learning something or, you know, like that's just kind of who I am. And if I really love it, like I did guitar, I didn't let go of it to where it actually kind of, well, it physically injured me. So I um, had to spend, you know, a few thousand dollars on physical therapy over two years. And that kind of set me back financially a little bit, but there was no other choice. I needed this Sorry, taken care of. So now I'm in a place where I'm actually pain free again. Um, and I can practice and I and I do play guitar again and I am writing good songs on guitar again. But that's why um, there's a lot of synthesizers uh, being used um, for a while is that that's how I could still write music. So and then I started to learn drums and um after i had gotten my uh, tendonitis taken care of and so yeah that's kind of like why the music started to change a little bit but um you know i there's still guitar that i'm playing but it would have to I, you know i was in i was in pretty severe pain for some of that um what were the bands that first inspired you to get going yeah um Let's see, I got some CDs here. So uh, I thought I got one other one. So uh, Heavy Heavy Lolo. Nice, yeah, um, I totally heard of them. They're great. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome because not all, oh, that's where that was. Sorry, my girlfriend's right here. And yeah, uh, it says Lexi Alexander. I'm Phoenix Alexander, but Lexi Alexander is just hanging out. This is her I Zoom, think. so apologies for that. I had, I <laughs> literally just realized. Um, so Heavy Heavy Lolo were a massive inspiration towards me. Um, Horse the band. Um, I, I was I was raised during the emo time, you know, so like Circus Survive, and uh, I was there was a venue called the Avalon that um, that was like in walkable distance from my house, but it was still a trek. Um, but my dad just like I had no rules after I was like twelve years old, like I could go wherever I wanted and whatever, and so uh, my friend would uh, walk with me there. And it was a pretty safe city, you know, we never had any troubles. And so we'd see we'd see a show probably every weekend for a long time. And so I saw a bunch of emo and hardcore, post-hardcore, screamo. And my music doesn't sound like that, but um that was that was a big inspiration on what wanted what made me want to like really do this, because these were just like dudes, you know, and like they were like on labels, but it was yeah, I mean, like, they weren't, like, mega rock stars necessarily, right? So it kind of gave me, like, some uh, inspiration. It was relatable for me. And then uh, The Locust. Um, this th this uh, is some of the most creative music that's, like, that I'd ever heard. And uh, so, you know, I was, really, I was into some really heavy, heavy music like that. And then I went through a phase where, like, I didn't listen to anything that had, like, even an amplifier. Like, I was just, like, acoustic you know, like classical and everything. So I, I've gone through different phases throughout my time. Now now I listen to a, a good mix of a lot of things, but a lot of industrial music. Uh, I can relate. Whenever I was younger, um, like in high school, 
I was like listening to like a lot of like weirder uh, like indie rock, but like also it, was, it wasn't like standard. Um, it was just like uh, bands you started to look up that just wasn't big. And um, I, all my friends, you know, they were really into hip hop and like mm -hmm. yes, it's like the more trendy stuff. And I would just completely reject it. Just was just like, no, that's not cool. That's not good. Like I'm not gonna give it like any time because like there's so many other artists that like are worth getting into. Now I'm 27. And I'm finally able to like turn on the radio and be like, I can I can get into some of this stuff or like go out of my way to like watch like vh1s like um you know like pop music videos and that kind of stuff did you ever kind of like watch like um you know back in the day when mtv was big like those kind of like uh mixture of music videos and stuff like that yeah um first let me say though that's so relatable what you were just saying um about all of that i feel like i had almost the exact same experience dude like <laughs> Um, are very similar, but I was so trapped in all of that because I, my house is the party house um, <laughs> for years, like, cause my dad just didn't care. Right. So like from like 15 years old to 18 years old, I mean, it was just like, just partying. And uh, I got it all out of my system at an extremely young age. And like, I'm thankful for it actually. Cause nowadays I don't party at all. And, yeah. Uh, so it allows me to, and I, I, nothing against people that do party. It's a life, yeah. man. You, you, this may be your only chance to live your life, have fun, whatever. But for, <laughs> yeah. me, so for my, for me, my, you know, I've, I've done that basically. And um, so I do Lil Wayne, Gucci Mane, like my house was known as the Gucci Mane house. Like <laughs> that was not due to me, you know, uh, I, I would throw some Pink Floyd in the mix and yeah. hook him in with Dark Side of the Moon, like, you know, <laughs> I would put on Jefferson Airplane, and but I, it was super hard for me to put on anything alternative because um, they would just change it. And even though it was my house, like it was like everyone, it was like a communal house, like people could just walk in and out. Like, um, it, you know, it was it was, it was pretty wild, uh, a super wild time. And so th that's so relatable. But I will say that as I've gotten older, it's like, well, Lemonade by Gucci Mane, one of my favorite songs. I've, oh, like that's, yeah. that, that's one of like the best songs ever made. I mean, not really, but like, d it's dance, awesome. you know, like everything. Like, there's so many good songs <laughs> there. It's definitely that higher tier of of musical genius, uh, in my opinion. Like, um, I'll say th that's the compliment I'll give it. That's realistic, and um, you know, I I I've tried to become super open minded. I've listened to a lot more hip hop, and our music is actually more influenced by hip hop. Uh, than ever before for like some of our more recent stuff and it's still not it doesn't sound like hip-hop it's influenced by it and so I, I've really tried to open my mind I went to a, a dead mouse rave when I was young and that was like the only rave I've been to but it was like most excellent so I used to listen to like a lot of like EDM yeah. and and I didn't really ever get into dubstep thankfully but all my <laughs> friends did and so I was stuck listening to dubstep and it was awful it has an era <laughs> I mean but awful for me if someone else likes it <laughs> um yeah. but yeah sorry so you had asked me a question i just derailed because i i really did relate to what you were saying um so i i apologize that i forgot the it, question it was about um you know watching like uh the series of different music videos and stuff like that huh. did that like inspire your own music um did you have fuse uh yeah, tv yeah okay sweet. And, and so direct tv like random like concert stuff like that i did that for a little bit yeah <laughs> i remember there were some points yeah yeah so i was in the same boat my favorite show was steven's untitled rock show oh hell yeah that mm -hmm. early days yeah so that was actually when i first heard circus survive i saw one of the music videos and i still remember that oh, yeah. you know and uh it was i think it was for uh, a great band I yeah, guess. yeah, I think, yeah, I think so too, man. I think they're most excellent. One of, one of the guys sound, or the side project sound of animals fighting, mm -hmm. that was one of those ones for me where I was like, okay, like, I really see that you have like this big idea about what you can do musically and where to apply this at. And um, I don't know, it really, it really did open up my eyes, especially to like the music at that time was just about like really getting it out there and playing and going to the next stop. And like, you don't get that today. Like no one's going on tour and from the shows that they play there and whenever they get back home, they were, they were playing there and back. Today it's just like little pit stops, not playing whenever I'm also coming back that way. 
they, it, that was just an era that we like we got to see um them playing the music live but also like getting different live versions and like mm-hmm. how that was like another thing for the uh bootlegs and that kind of stuff uh, you i don't know today it's like um it's like a lot about like, the backtracks and like you get in the same show you know absolutely no yeah. you're you're 100 right and a lot of those bands were actually better alive sometimes than the albums you know yeah. um because they were playing out so much and studio playing in the studio and playing in uh live are two completely different experiences that really don't translate to the other all that well and they're two totally different in my opinion like i view them as two separate things it's like um and yeah i'm so thankful that i got to see some of those bands dude i'm kicking myself in the head that i missed course the band i just forgot about it <laughs> I, I i don't know if i'll ever forget myself yeah there's like, like, one chance there's a, there's a, I, there's always i think uh some of those acts where you're like i didn't think i'd ever get the chance to see them um and and i guess also to a vibe osmosis question uh favorite caller because i didn't get to that favorite what your favorite caller color yeah oh man you know, um, huh? Uh, as far as, you know, I'll say like as far as like um, bands like wearing clothes goes, Black is um, a really good one because like yeah. the Velvet un- the Velvet Underground purposefully dressed all in black so that it was almost like they were like a mirror, like a reflection of of the audience that the audience had no fancy clothes to distract them with but rather yeah um, would 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 see something very relatable there and so i think that you know um as colors are situational um for my visual art i use a lot of pinks and and this like light blue and like this like kind of weird like neon green color together but then i also use different color combinations there's like websites where you can um get color palettes and so i like to scroll through those occasionally um a lot of the colors just kind of make them pardon me a lot of the colors kind of make themselves my art just through um putting on different overlays and uh just kind of going off of intuition and and in the moment creation but um i do have a lot of color palettes that i seem to return to a lot you know Um, (laughs) yeah but i i'm i'm on this i'm on this page of like um with your music now, like you kind of done from studio stuff and you've also done like the bedroom kind of project stuff and you've also like incorporated like different kinds of beats and uh, different kinds of like aspects of making music. Did, did you ever kind of um, ever go into like music where you're like, I just want to have um, like these instruments in mind like is that kind of how it laid out or did you like this is the gear that i have and this is like how i'm going to record it i was always really interested because like um you you had like sitars and stuff and and some stuff so it just looks like um you could have gone any direction even with like a didgeridoo you know (laughs) yeah um yeah i studied eastern music for a while in high school i used to play the sitar and um and so I learned about tabla. I learned about um, different kind of uh, ragas, and uh, I would I would play different ragas according to what time of day it was and whatnot because of the traditions there. And uh, and then I went to India at some point, and that was very uh, transformative for me. I'd say uh, I'd say that changed me a lot. And um, you know, I think I I think about the John Lennon quote where it's like, I'm not doing what's best for any particular person in a room, I'm doing what's best for the Beatles. And I I, I, I try and relate that to, to my songs where it's whatever's best for the song. And uh, if I'm choosing one instrument over another, it's nothing against any instrument. If I'm choosing a performance over another, like there's times where I'll lay down a bass, but I know that Andrew can do it better. And my feelings are secondary if I want a really good um you know end result and so uh a lot of it is preconceived and then some of it is a lot of it is also in the moment you know um so if we're sitting there listening to the song 
and it needs some doubled up vocals on the chorus or um, an extra guitar, um, then let's just do it. One thing that's really inspiring to me is uh, reading about other engineers and how they make um, music and, and producers and how they go about getting these big sounds. And uh, I really want to do at least some songs or an album like where we just have like a mountain of guitars, like like never mind kind of, um, <laughs> or like like Smashing Pumpkins is probably a better, uh, yeah. more accurate example of what's in my mind. Um, kind of like that old Butch Vig method, um, you know. So like reading about different producers gives me a lot of different ideas. Um. Now, this one is about a. Uh... Oh yeah, I didn't ask this one yet either. Um, favorite movie? Cool. Um, I really like Stanley Kubrick. So, oh yeah, sorry, uh, Lexi's. Uh, we just watched a date movie last night. It's like atrocious, right. and <laughs> I mean, but like it is, it is amazing too, right? It's no, just dude, like right. it's its own thing, right? So like. I, I was jokingly telling Lexi, like, I'm going to tell people from now on that's my favorite movie, but <laughs> it, <laughs> it, if we're if we're being serious, uh, I, I like Stanley Kubrick films a lot, but um, <laughs> because he's so well known, let me give you like an example of, uh, let, let me maybe give, give a suggestion that's lesser known. Um, there's a really good, I, I really like documentaries. Uh, especially documentaries about uh, musicians and there's one about the guy from pentagram i really like that one and then of course dig dig is like one of like my most watched films ever you know sure. um so yeah i would say that i i i you know i don't find myself watching like a ton of movies these days unfortunately i i kind of want to make more time for it but yeah um stanley kubrick is probably my favorite director um, how do you feel about like uh, surrealism, uh, stuff like David Lynch? Are you like um, more like into like a non-fantasy realm, or do you still enjoy like that weirdness that it kind of takes you? Um, I I love Eraserhead. It's one of my yeah. favorite movies. Um, the first time I watched it, I could hardly I could hardly look past my fingers for some parts, <laughs> and I think that that's that's a real that's real art. You know, so my uh, my favorite Stanley Cooper film is A Clockwork Orange and very, very much similar, right? So it's a horrifying movie. Like, why would anyone ever, I mean, it was a book first, but, and I love the book. The book is one of my favorite books, but um, like, why would anyone ever think of this or whatever? But that's, that's, that's reality, you know? Um, but the surrealism stuff, it's not reality, but it's, it's poetic uh, for me. And so I, I love that stuff. Um, I, one director that I think really gets a good mix of the, of, of the two surreal and real somehow mixes them is, uh, Lars von Trier and, uh, yeah, uh, Melancholia is one of my favorite movies probably. And like the, the beginning is like so weird and, uh, so not normal. Um, oh, uh, Phantom of the Paradise is one of my favorite films. And that, that's, that's, uh, uh, sorry, that that that's more about the question that you asked before. Apologies, um, but yeah, surreal, like, dude, You're right. for me, like art and movies and music and all this stuff, like the different styles are just different flavors. You know, like it's like food. It's like why restrict yourself to just Chinese food or just Mexican food or just that if you have all these options, you know? And living in America, we're a cultural melting pot, and so that's that's. Um, you know, I, I consider myself very American in that way, where I appreciate lots of different flavors of all kinds of different things. Um, now, one of the uh, one of the things that I noticed about your music, though, um, not all of them have, you know, lyrics, and some of them have these like weirder, uh, like interludes, um, mm -hmm. and not, like just like just a, a straight up instrument or like it's a beat track or something um is that kind of something that you've planned or had in mind or is that kind of something in the moment too where it's like that was the focus on you know um i think on our first two albums we only had like one or two instrumental songs per album and then uh 
anytime that someone would be like, oh, I listen to your album, my favorite song is this one, it was usually the instrumental. And like, maybe they just didn't like my voice and I just didn't have enough feedback. Like now I've had enough feedback where it's like, I've heard all, all sorts of positive, negative, constructive, non-constructive, you know, like I, it's it's all like, I, I've heard a, a bit more of a gamut now, uh, w which I appreciate. Um, I, I, I will never turn down uh, criticism. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's just my that's just how i feel um the yeah so the first two albums like people were like oh yeah like the instrumental songs are my favorite we actually started as an instrumental band like for our first recording so um i, I got this um so bitches brew obviously very famous album um <laughs> december 25th 2016 my girlfriend lexi got me that album while we were living underneath a staircase. And uh, there's a vinyl record player in the other room that we could use, you know, here and there. And so nice. she got me that record and I was looking at that record and I was like, man, they had got all these people on it, you know, and all that, and like, it's just like this like really collaborative thing. I mean, I, I love the record for years, but really kind of like seeing like vinyl is just something else, you know, you like you really can like sit there and look at like the track listings and look at like the the personnel and and look at you know it's it's an, it's more of an experience it's a heightened experience and so um i was i was doing that with this album i just got and um that's actually where soul Side came from is that 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 moment i i thought i want to do this too and i had thought of the name soul psych and i was like well this is how we should go about this band so um we started from an album that has no lyrics and um so our first session was on february 1st 2017 so just like a, a month and a half later um yeah six weeks later we did a session called the saturn session and it was one 10-hour session five hours of it was setting up the other five hours we made soul sex ep and we made our album saturn and there's not a single well there there actually are some vocals on it. lexi um does some uh vocals uh tibetan chants and then um, there's there's like a uh, shoot Gregorian chant or something like that. And so uh, I was n I, none of my vocals were on the first <laughs> Soul Psych session. And then after I had been writing songs for years and I've been singing for years, so when we did Neptune, um, we tapped into the vocals. So yeah, it's kind of we've, we're kind of all over the place, which I think has actually kind of made us a little bit inaccessible for some people. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just like it's it's kind of a double-edged sword, I think. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think that time is our is going to be our friend uh, because over time, like if you look at any band's discography, there's all these albums that like no one knows that band from. But then there's like that one or two that like everyone's wearing on shirts all the time. Like how many how many Pink Floyd albums are out there that are like totally inaccessible to like tons of Dark Side of the Moon fans, you know? So like. Time, time will be our friend, I think, and uh, yeah. Um, I guess uh, one thing. What kind of questions did you have? I, I guess before we go, because I, I kind of have to head out a little bit soon. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite Alcove Dream song? Do you have one? I, I have to say now, after working on, um, I did work on a music video with Alcove Dream. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. was thinking now though, at first it was um the Brown song. It's it's definitely changed the Severed Hearts. Sweet, yeah. sweet. Yeah. Nice. What about you? Um, uh, stop talking to me. Like oh, I, I'm I just good. <laughs> I, I maybe it's because it's like the first song that I heard where I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, but yeah, um uh yeah, th I think that's like you know, uh, just an amazing song. Um there's one other one that I'm terrible with song names, but there's one other one that I really, really like by him that uh, I'm spacing the name of. Um, uh, so uh, let's see. If you were on a Jerry Springer episode, what would the episode be about? Um, I would. I would probably say it would probably be about um, like that person met me on Craigslist and now. Um, I have a baby that I didn't know about or something. <laughs> that's that's a great answer to that. <laughs> um, let's see. <laughs> um, so let's see. 
Yeah, what was New York like? Like, were you paying like three thousand? I, I assume that you lived there, and like, if you did, were you paying like three thousand dollars to live in like a closet, like all the YouTube videos talk about, or is it not like that? I would say no matter what you pay, it's it's kind of shitty no matter what, unless unless it's I think it's always a mentality. Um, like my girlfriend, she did not like um, New York, but at the same time. There's aspects that you like about it because, like, you're getting like, to actually be out till four in the morning, or and actually like, have stuff to do. Like, we were went to this one like showbox theater thing that started at like eight o'clock, and we literally got out of the place at like three in the morning, and we were like, after we got out of there, it felt like that place was a fantasy world. Like anything could have happened in there. And it just was like, oh no, that was the magic that I guess that, you know, you can have that every night and then also go back and then be like, well, this part sucks, this part sucks. And it's a give and take in every situation. I, I, love, I love work. I love living in Seattle and working in Seattle more. I'd say I like the West Coast more. Cool. West has people, yeah, and there's beaches, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah things we take for granted right <laughs> yes. uh let's see how long do you think america has left oh this one's really good um i i think about this one because um i'm i'm really big on the global warming thing okay. and and um people are always saying how it's getting colder or, or like the sun eventually will die out nobody knows exactly when things are going to happen i always think that um it's not the aliens that's going to kill us it's not it's like the mother nature it's like going to be like something happening from the sky or like actually just like everything just falls into the earth or something i'm really i think it's like a like it will happen so fast, like in a killer movie, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And and to say how long that we have, it could be a couple hundred years if we're lucky. Cool. Yeah, every empire has got to fall, right? <laughs> Other people think it's like thousands and millions of years ahead and and stuff, and or like the resurrection, and I, I don't know. I I'm really interested on like an actual time frame. It would be cool if it was like. 2024 we actually know they thought it was happening in 1999 <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so 1999 had been a hell of a year by the end of the year <laughs> uh, i think the y2k actually happened i'm one of those people <laughs> no i i don't know i i, I think i'm open to it you know I'm open to it. um let's see um i'll ask you just like one or two more if that's okay yeah uh what do you think about personality tests? Do you think they're just a bunch of hogwash or you think there's something to it? Well, say this to a person that has uh, multiple personalities. Um, they're going to obviously tap into something that they want projected at that exact given moment, but then the next maybe moment they have a different personality. So to what extent is that personality very true i want to know because like you could have multiple personalities in you and then find out like it's all correlated to uh one personality too because that's I was, I was like a psychology thing that um you can have multiple personalities inside one one whole uh uh personality so that's like one thing where i'm like are you actually in control of this or is that something that's like you're out of that control and that's like actual science happening um i don't know that's a good question hmm. um yeah thank you uh have you ever done uh sensory deprivation and kind of experiment like that yeah i have and i did it really young first off oh. and uh, one of the times was whenever i did dmt um, and I also did used to use one of these, uh, the lamps that had, um, a lot of different, um, holes drilled into them. Yeah. They had like a lot of different, uh, pictures inside of them too. So oh, okay. Actually. Yeah. Just like, uh, visualize. And, um, uh, I remember taking that to like, that had the shed music shed. So I used to like, just like go to the music shed, had that in there one time and got really, really stoned and had and just like kind of like locked myself in to just like watch this for like had it been at least an hour or two felt meditative but you're also kind of like in this 
and you kind of have to stay like in a zone to like really get the grasp and that's where I think you're trying to find out like how strong you are mentally to like focus on this and like that's your only like prerogative and there's something like that like whenever you're taking like mushrooms and like LSD like sometimes you can allow like everything else like you know affect your trip but if you really want to hone in on like maybe the trauma or like your actual feelings or other than like um superficial things then you actually have a better idea of like what you're going through um and that's that's something about like the sensory deprivation like deprivation test i've seen a lot of um a lot of that has to go back to like sacred healing uh which is which is like a whole you know thing in itself and it has a dichotomy too besides like how people uh, follow certain traditions which is really really neat on how uh the tarot and stuff like that kind of came into picture and like um the actual like, geologists finding out like why these sediments and how uh, certain rocks have different purposes from different cultures that was like you know hundreds of years ago yeah. I, you know just getting really into it but <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> No, it's cool. Yeah, um, I think that there's a huge compound to our primal side that we uh, don't really understand. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I just want to show like a few more albums and then I'll, I'll, we'll say goodbye if that's okay. Definitely, man. Definitely. Um, I'm a huge fan of The Fall, Middle Class Revolt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of fans actually uh, don't like it. Do you album. actually think... have a CD player? Yeah, I have a six CD player in my car. So I just load that up and just uh, drive around. Mm -hmm um ministry twitch super big uh, influence um happy mondays um this this fun. album is like hated it's called yes please people yeah. hate this album i think it's amazing um and then uh i'm not gonna try and pronounce this band uh well okay i i'm struzende nubatan i think i got almost kind of close but uh this is one of my favorite <laughs> albums um the the album is called end day now um really really makes you rethink production for me like th this and screamadelica were like two albums that made me think way different about what you could do with music um but yeah jeffrey i want to thank you for this this was like so awesome and uh like my favorite interview that i've ever done um to bring that though Jimi hendrix was a really big inspiration for me um were you kind of also a big big influence like, Absolutely. Yeah. So, like, does that something like early on days, or like, you know, or did you kind of have to like find your own time to listen to Jimmy? Um, I, cause I, like, I heard of Jimi Hendrix before. My, my guitar teacher was like, um, I'm gonna teach you this song, and by Jimi Hendrix, I was like, you know who that is? I, like, I really didn't know, no. But you know, now I, you know, it took me that time to like listen and study. Like what kind of what kind of period do you think it happened for you? Definitely when I, more so when I was younger, but I love him. Right? He's he's in this room and he's in the other room because um, <laughs> he's a uh, he is a uh, anomaly. You know, I mean, uh, he's so gifted, and it's it, it's almost like it came pre-installed in him, or that he just was a satellite that was so tapped into things above him. And he really wasn't alive for that long. I've outlived him, you know, which yeah. is pretty wild considering his impact on culture. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that he's one of the most amazing musicians that uh, has, has graced us. And I feel extremely blessed to uh, exist in the same timeline that his music does because uh, it's just so spiritual and, and, and cool. Uh, what's your favorite song before we go? Yeah, it says I have less than a minute, so I might disappear any moment now. Yeah. Uh, uh, the When Christ Mary, or Sp uh, Spanish Castle Magic. Yeah, those are probably my two favorite. I also really like uh, that one uh, 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 Chili Peppers album, uh, Mother's Milk, because it's, oh, yeah. it's super influenced by Jimi Hendrix. But yeah, um, yeah, man, I can't thank you enough for this. I, I, I really am thankful for this interview. Well, I hope you have a good rest of your day and thank you for joining Bible Osmosis. Thank you. Thank you.